So welcome to our, another of our How Conversations. It's a delight and a distinct pleasure, and frankly, it's special to welcome you, Ajay Banga. Uh, Ajay, you and I have long uh, considered ourselves in common cause, kindred in spirit, kindred philosophically. Uh, it's an honor that you are a founding member of the board of directors of the How Institute for Society. But in terms of what you do day in, day out, you lead and you are currently the executive chairman at MasterCard. Uh, before that, you led a remarkable journey of leadership as the CEO of MasterCard for over 11 years. But I celebrate you for being at the Vanguard and proving that business can be an incredible and enduring force for good, for positive societal change, uh, as value and extraordinary value in your case uh, is created. So welcome and uh, thank you for, uh, for joining us. How are it's you? a pleasure, Gav, and thank you for uh, for all that you do. You're the guy who, over time, I've listened to you, I've read what you what you've been writing, and now you're putting your own self out there as well with the How Institute to lend real meat to the idea of the importance of How. So I'm looking forward to being a part of this conversation. So where am I finding you? Just share some I don't know reflections on uh, on the world, and then I want to step back and just. Take us through your, your journey uh, of moral leadership. But start with, where am I finding you? Uh, emotionally, psychologically, philosophically? So physically, I'm in, in our office where I've been throughout the pandemic. I've been in office every day. My view of where things are right now in the world around where the world is, where things are, is not, is not uninformed by this fact that I've been here physically through this period. Because I've now seen people come back to work in our office. I can see the numbers increasing. I can see the number of cars in the car park increasing. I meet more people in the corridor. I find them wandering by to say hello. I find them coming by to say, I'm vaccinated. Can I give you a hug? It's nice yeah. to be back. I know you've been, you know, there's a whole thing to it. And I think that tells you that we seem to have turned the tide here, but at the same time, I'm of Indian origin, and the country I came from is in deep yeah. trouble on the pandemic right now. And in a, in a way that is very disturbing to, to anybody who either lives there or has family or friends there. And it feels like the developed world is getting more done on vaccinations, is getting more done on economic energy in the form of fiscal and monetary stimulus. I think the developing world is struggling on that. And some parts of the developing world, like India, like parts of Latin America and parts of Africa, seem to be particularly stressed during this period. And so I feel like the progress we've made on inclusion, the progress we've made on poverty alleviation, it feels like the clock's been turned back a little bit over the last 12 to 15 months. The third part, now which you know well, is our own employees. And I've tried as a as a leader, along with Michael, who is now my replacement as CEO, we both tried really hard to be there for our employees. We've told them your jobs are safe. Nobody will lose their jobs because of the pandemic through 2020. And it's now early into 21, and we're still sticking by that. You know, globally, we're not yet on the other side of the pandemic, but at least where you are physically are right now, we're starting to turn the corner to quote you. If you had to just share one lesson for leaders uh, in this post-pandemic world, what would it be? A lesson that you took from the pandemic. That, I guess that two, not one. The first one is we clearly didn't see this coming. But then more to do with leadership. I think what I've learned is that communication, simple, transparent, trustworthy communication, speaking from your heart, and not from notes, speaking to what you really are worried about and what people who are listening to you are worried about, those became even more important during the crisis than they ever were before the crisis. You've said before that for you, uh, the source of so much of this is humility, right? Uh, why is yeah. humility the seat of being able to be this kind of leader that comes from the heart that can provide hope, truth, transparency? Why, why have you said that humility is the root of it all? 
So I think humility and humor yeah. are the root of their leadership because humor allows you to empathize very quickly yeah. with those who are listening to you. And humility allows you to keep your feet on the ground and listen to people around you so you can both understand their concerns, but you can also learn from the views they bring to the table. After all, Dav, what if you believe that you're the smartest guy in the room, then you probably are not. You, I've said this to you, God gave you two ears, two eyes, and one mouth for a reason. There's a reason for that ratio. So you should watch and listen more than you speak. And yeah. it's that brings the idea of humility is connected to the idea of realizing that you can always learn from somebody else. And the idea of learning from somebody else is connected to the root of listening. Otherwise, how are you gonna learn? Right. So, and it's a great, and then listening is a sign of respect because when you listen- Correct. You're, it, all you're, it, it all goes together. It all goes together. It all goes together. And you don't have to agree. I, people mistake listening for agreement. Listening is paying attention. And so I'm glad you raised that. And so if you listen carefully, you'll pick it up. They don't have to always agree. There are times when you and I don't agree. But I'll still listen to you because you deserve that. During the pandemic, you said that you guaranteed everybody's job, meaning whatever animates you, you focused on saving lives and livelihoods. Uh, it now seems that that same animating ethos of saving is being turned towards not getting back to selling things, but to serving. Uh, and at the same time, truth comes before all else. So when you know truth is uh, at the root of all things, uh, as a leader, how do you forge shared truths at a time where uh, there are some powerful forces out there that are making it harder to share truths? Well, Duff, truth is a very interesting word because truth is both an adjective and a verb right. and a noun, depending on how you look at it. Right. It's one of those words. It means everything, depending which way you interpret it, right? And the first truth you have to come to terms with is that you're not perfect and you're going to make mistakes. So that All that requires transparency. You're going to be able to hold up a mirror to yourself and say, oh, that's what I look like. Mm -hmm. And uh, and transparency breeds trust. Right. And so, yes, I know that today's world is more complicated by, I guess, the speed of the spread of information, of digital media, of uh, connectivity. But mind you, that's also the charm of today's world over the world I grew up in as a young person. So, you know, you, the goods and the bads come together with everything. And so my view is that the best way to deal with the absence of trust is to drive even harder for transparency. And you set that example yourself. You can't ask other people to be transparent if you are not going to be transparent. And the one thing that our employees would tell you about me is that with me, they know exactly where they stand. There are no secrets. I will tell them if I think they're talking bunk right now. Mm -hmm. And I will tell them if I think they're doing a great job. They don't have to agree with me. I also tell them you're free to disagree. And I want you to find your own voice. That's kind of what I want our culture to be. Right. This questioning everything, every always culture, right? That culture, requires transparency and requires trust because how the heck are you going to question me if you can't trust that I won't freak out on you if you question me? Or if I do freak out on you at that moment because I made a mistake, right. I won't hold it at heart. And I will realize that actually I'm glad now I've raised this. That trust comes through transparency. And so, you know, yes, people are not trusting each other, but you're going to be transparent. And the last part, Dav, and then I'll, I'll pause to take what you were just saying because I'll forget this, is please, please. I'm deeply worried about the binary culture that somehow seems to have taken root in society, which is a yes or a no. Everything is black or white. There are no grays in between. Unfortunately, life requires you to deal with a series of grays. And how you navigate your way through those 
is what determines how happy you feel later yeah. and how involved you are with everybody and how inclusive is your behavior and how open are your arms to being hugged. And not just being hugged by people who look like you and walk like you and talk like you and grew up like you and went to the same schools as you and worked with you for 20 years, but by being hugged by people who don't look like you and didn't walk like you and didn't go to the same schools. And that, to me, is the magic of diversity. That is the real meaning of diversity. Walk us through in your efforts to shape a culture that is respectful but questioning that is built to navigate the gray. Values were not invented for the easy black and white decisions. Values were invented for tough decisions, for trade-offs, for, for dilemmas, for navigating the gray. And I think it's fair to say that you believe that you should win via decency, not with decency as though it's an extra obligation. Oh yeah, oh yeah, but you should win first. Yeah. It's important because you're in a business organization that cannot do all the good things you think you can do with it if you're not winning. Because without that, there's no blood in the, in, the, in the body, right? So you need to win. But how you win and why you win is, all, is, is as important as the fact that you win. And that's the point about decency. You use the word culture and then you went to values very quickly. And, and you're a student of philosophy, so I understand why you did that. My, Wait, I'm not a student of philosophy. My approach to it is... You're just a natural philosopher, but go ahead. No, I, <laughs> I just, I'm just telling you what I think, right? My view is that, uh, that culture is a difficult word to describe, but values are something I comprehend. Yeah. I can put my arms around. Culture is kind of amorphous. It, I don't know how to put my fingers around it. Values, I can... I mean, the around. definition of culture is how things really happen around this place and what's the beating right. heart, what's animating it. But right. go ahead. Right. So that's what excites me. And I, so I tried to describe the values I wanted our company to live by through a few words that I began to use over time. And the first was the one about listening, that you have to listen. But combined with that, and these are all the dichotomies, the grays. On the one hand, you have to have the patience to listen. But on the other side of it, you have to have the urgency to do. So Leonardo da Vinci said, right, that, that knowing is not enough, you have to apply. And being willing is not enough, you have to do. That, that dichotomy, the patience to listen with the urgency to do, most people struggle with that. But that's what life is about. Yeah. Because you're never gonna have perfect information. And if you keep looking for perfect information, the train will pass you by on the station, you're gonna be standing there. So you gotta do, you gotta get on the train and go for the ride by reducing what risks you can. And therefore that's the second part, which is you gotta take a risk because there is no reward without a risk. There is no arbitrage if there's no risk reward equation. But you gotta do it thoughtfully which means if you don't know enough about it, ask somebody. If you think you know enough, still make sure you ask somebody else to take a look at that risk. So the second value, the first one was listening and urgency of doing. Second was thoughtful risk taking. And the last value that I was trying to imbibe into people was therefore you can't do all this. I can't persuade you to take a thoughtful risk with urgency if I don't empower you to make a decision. But if I'm going to empower you, then you've got to be willing to be accountable. Because if things go wrong, I need you to be able to stand up and say, I made a mistake before it goes too far wrong. If you shovel things under the carpet, only bad things happen in business. And I said, you've got to bring your DQ to work, your decency quotient, which is your heart and your mind, so that people will follow you. They should feel your hand on their back, not in their face. I think uh, it's fair to say that you and I agree that the world has been reshaped in ways to fuse things that were kept apart. Uh, it's cliche to say, but I think there's truth that the business of business is no longer just business. The business of business is society, responsibility, humanity, climate, the future. What does stakeholder capitalism mean, especially in today's post-pandemic world? So I believe that 
businesses cannot prosper in a failing world. And therefore, in your own best self-interest is the idea of ensuring that the ecosystem around you is robust because you are there and for you being there. Mm. Right? That's the idea. My view is that the world's problems lie on three sides of a triangle. One side of the triangle is the trade-off between one and many. Again, we're back to grays. Yeah. And this is economic inclusion, social inclusion, educational inclusion, health inclusion, whatever, that. The other side of the triangle is the trade-off between humanity and nature. Climate, green, all the things we're struggling with today. And the reason the triangle, these two sides stay up is because the bottom side of the triangle is the one that is very strong and gives them the power to stay up. And that's the trade-off between long-term and short-term. And there is too much incentive in society, in politics, in companies, in parenting, in schooling, in anything, for short-term solutions. You apply short-term solutions to long-term problems, that's a Band-Aid. Nothing wrong with the Band-Aid for the short term. It doesn't cauterize the wound and fix it. And so, this is my way of explaining all this, which is that I embrace capitalism because it has done more in the last four decades to help reduce poverty, to help expand education, to help expand healthcare, to help expand many things. But it's done a lot of bad things along the way. The concentration of money, the impact on our climate, this inequality, this climate inequality, those two sides of the triangle, they don't work for me and they don't work for my children right. and they don't work for you and they don't work for your children. So the triangle is very much a part of the same how way. I think about circumstances I encounter. But remember, everyday business doesn't neatly fit into that triangle. But the triangle gives you a way of thinking. And that way of thinking is the framework. I mean, I told you we made a tough choice around jobs last year. So our profitability went down. It's been, in my 11 years as CEO, it is the first year in which we didn't go profits compared to the prior years. When we took the decision to not lay off people, we took the decision to absorb that hit. Right. It's a tough hit, but it's the right hit for the long term. You know why? Because those very people are far more loyal today. And by the way, the skills they had and the capabilities they have is what's made our company who they are and what it is. So I have no doubt that some people will choose to leave, others won't perform as well, and we may have to part company with them. We may have duplicate people in some places where we buy another company. This, these things happen, yeah. I got it. And those things need to be fixed, but not because of the pandemic. That's the moral imperative of that decision. That's the long-term, short-term trade-off of that decision. The pandemic just accelerated and presented you with the decision. Correct. But it was your moral triangle <laughs> that you Correct. brought to the decision that Correct. the pandemic uh, tested you with in some ways. Yes. So as we wrap up, uh, Aja, you shared so much. Uh, there's, a, there's a Talmudic <laughs> adage that what comes from the heart enters the heart. Uh, and what I love about you is that you are unabashed about that, you know, that you think the heart makes the world go around. Um, one piece of advice to this next generation and then just one more two more things and we'd like i'd love to wrap up I, I know you have a busy day still ahead so i think the one piece of advice i'd give you is to never discount luck mm. life is 50 percent luck and uh, you know all the things i'm describing i've gone through bad days with the same behavior and good days with the same behavior this uh, heart on your sleeve also gets me into trouble yeah. And so luck has to be there for you. You know, what you do with the luck is what describes the other 50%. And you're actually wrapping up this conversation uh, in full circle uh, by acknowledging that half of life is luck. Isn't that the greatest expression of your deep value of humility? Because uh, if you're not humble, you're going to think you did it all yourself. So, uh, you certainly didn't. You so, certainly, you know, there but for the grace of God go I kind of thing, right? So yeah. don't forget that. But the acknowledgement of the role luck plays is what is what makes and keeps uh, somebody humble. It's the truth. It's the truth. 
So the logic, truth will set you free, right? So indeed, and in your case, smooth seas have never created a great mariner. And the way you've sailed uh, rough seas, always with decency, is a is a is a real enduring example to to so many others that look up to you and 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 follow you. Uh, close this conversation with what gives you hope. Uh, moral leaders such as yourself, a, a moral leader is a purveyor of hope. So in the spirit of purveying hope, uh, what should we tap into to, to be hopeful? I mean, human beings are nothing if not hopeful. Yeah. So what allows us to, to be the superior beings on this planet is hope, because hope has made us innovate. Hope has made us quest for new frontiers. Hope has made, has made us competitively paranoid. Hope has made us everything. So my belief is that optimism and hope is innate to human life. And so why would you ever give that up? I don't give it up. I'm an eternal optimist, but that's part of what makes me who I am. Ajay, it's been a genuine pleasure to, to be together online uh, next time uh, in person. In person. But, but thank you for embracing this how conversation and sharing from the heart and imparting uh, really exquisite wisdom. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you for the opportunity.